Hey y'all, in this video I'm going to get into a topic that I should have gotten into a long time ago, and that is ramps and leads. We're going to discuss what they are and when you would use them. Before we get started, however, I'd like to remind you that today at noon Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern Time, I'll be hosting a live Q&A session right here on my YouTube channel where we'll discuss ramps, leads, or anything else I cover in this video. Again, that's noon Pacific, 3 Eastern, right here on my YouTube channel. And I'll put a link in the description box below to that live Q&A session. I hope to see you this afternoon. Ramps and leads are generally used with the profile toolpath, but not exclusively. There are some ramps that are available in other toolpaths, but leads are only offered in the profile toolpath. Now, since these are toolpath operations, let's go ahead and go over to the toolpath tab. Now, as you can see, I have some vectors already out here. And I have some toolpaths already calculated to demonstrate some of the options that are available to you in using these ramps and leads. We'll go ahead and we'll check out the 3D view. And we'll go into a straight Z view and magnify it up here so you can see it. And we'll take a look at a profile toolpath with no ramp. And I'll just kind of lay it back here, spin it around so you can see, and I'll zoom in on this square. If we look here at our toolpath, remember the red line is a rapid move. This is the bit coming over in a rapid move to the start point of this vector. Now it's kind of hard to tell the colors in this illustration because we have a plunge downward and a retract in the same place. A plunge move is illustrated in light blue and a retract is illustrated in green. So since they're both one on top of the other, it's hard to tell what's going on here. But basically the bit's going to come over here along this red line, which is the rapid move till it gets over the start point to this vector, then it's going to plunge straight down to this first pass depth, indicated in dark blue. It'll then move in X or Y, whichever the case may be, until it finishes cutting at that pass depth, gets around here to the start point again, then it'll plunge down again, then make the second pass, and continue on until it gets down to the last cutting depth, where it'll go around, finish the cut, then retract all the way out of the material, and head back over to the origin point. Let's go ahead and turn this off, and we'll take a look at a smooth ramp. And I'll show you what all these mean here in just a minute. A smooth ramp, you can see, is quite different. And what a smooth ramp is, is once again we have our red rapid move, then we come over here to the start point, and we can see by this light blue line right here, it's going to plunge down to our Z1 distance, then start moving, in this case, in Y. And that bit is going to start lowering down until it gets into its first cut depth. Then it'll take off and cut that first pass until it gets around to where that ramp started. Then the Z will kick in, and it will gradually lower the bit down to the next pass depth. It'll cut its way around the vector until it gets to the point where that ramp began, then slowly lower itself down to the next cutting depth. In this case, you'll notice it has to negotiate a corner. That's fine. The software knows how to do that. My point in all of this is 
the bit will gradually lower into the material rather than just plunge straight down. Now, why would you want that? Why is that beneficial? Well, for a couple of reasons. I've got some pictures here. Let's see if you have ever seen anything like this before. These little cut areas on the edge of a cut piece. These are known as dwell marks. This is where the bit comes over to the start point and plunges in right here, then starts cutting. Works its way around the part, comes back over, plunges down again. In fact, you can even see the different layers, the different places where the bit stopped its plunge and then took off running. If you look very carefully over here on this edge, you can see the lines at each pass depth where the bit cut in. These dwell marks are caused by bit deflection or a little bit of flex in your gantry or any number of other variables. A ramp will prevent this from happening in that the bit will slowly lower itself into the material as the X and Y, in this case, are moving, avoiding this deflection. It's a gradual plunge. It's not a direct plunge straight in. Now, these dwell marks are not limited to end mills. They also happen with V-bits. If you have ever used a V-bit to carve a chamfer into the edge of a project or a ball nose to cut a cove and have seen a mark like this, that is a dwell mark. That is where the bit has plunged into the material straight down and then taken off to do its cutting. Using a ramp will eliminate these dwell marks. So, that is a smooth ramp. Now let's go back to a straight Z view here and let's take a look at these tool paths that I have calculated here. First one is no ramp. And when you first go into a profile tool path, this is what you're likely to find. You'll need to put in your cut depth, your tool, decide whether you're going to machine to the outside, the inside, or on the vector. And you get down here. And this here is the area that we're going to be focusing on in this video. You'll notice this entire area here is grayed out. That's because we haven't put a check mark in this line, add ramps to toolpath. Now I'm going to close this and I'll come in to this profile toolpath where we have added ramps to toolpath. I have it checked. And here we have three decisions to make. And this is the type of ramp we're going to use. We can use a smooth ramp, which is what I use almost 100% of the time. We can have a zigzag ramp, or we can have a spiral ramp. A smooth ramp is simply that. The bit is going to lower itself in till it gets to this first pass depth then X and Y will take over. A word about this. When I say the bit is gradually going to lower in, what I mean by that is your CNC router will always move at the speed of the slowest axis. In this case, we're talking about the plunge rate for this particular bit. Now, if I go up here to my end mill and I click on Edit, we can see here that my plunge rate is 30 inches per minute. That means that it doesn't matter what I have my feed rate set at. My Z axis is my slowest axis. So the bit is going to plunge in at 30 inches per minute. And the X and Y are going to move at 30 inches per minute. So if I want to speed up this ramp, I'll have to speed up my plunge rate for this cut. Again, the speed of the ramp is dictated by the plunge rate. So whatever plunge rate you have set here, that's how fast 
that ramp is going to be cut. Doesn't matter what your feed rate is. Once that bit gets down to that first pass depth up here, the Z will stop plunging, the X and Y will take over, and they'll take off at whatever feed rate you have set here. So, to simplify that, in this particular instance, this toolpath, the X and Y will take off at 30 inches per minute, the Z will plunge at 30 inches per minute until that bit reaches this first pass depth, the Z will stop, and the X and Y will take over at 60 inches per minute in this example. I'm not going to change that, just letting you know that's how the speed of the ramp cut is determined. Now we can also use a zigzag ramp. And what a zigzag ramp will do is, as illustrated by this drawing here and this drawing here, it will lower itself into the material this distance, one inch in this case, to half of that pass depth then reverse direction and lower itself down the rest of the way to that pass depth. So it will make a zigzag motion to lower itself in. Personally, I never use this. I haven't found a situation where I was, I've needed it. Then you have a spiral tool path. A spiral tool path is just as it's described. The bit will lower in at the plunge rate in a spiral pattern following the vector, whether you're going outside, inside, or on. I, again, tend to use smooth almost all the time. Now, with a smooth or zigzag ramp selected, we have another choice to set the distance or an angle. Now, if you want this ramp to be done over a specific distance, let's say you want it to make a gentle slope, you can set this quarter-inch bit to ramp in over a distance of two inches, for example, meaning it's going to come over to the start point and then it's going to start ramping its way down to this first pass depth over a distance of two inches. That's a gentle slope. This comes in handy with V-bits if you're cutting a chamfer. Generally speaking, depending upon the bit, I try to go four to eight times the bit's diameter. So anywhere, in this case being a quarter inch end mill, anywhere from one to two inches is my normal ramp distance for this bit. If you're using a large bit like a uh, fly cutter or something to uh, surface a spoil board, if it does not have a cutter all the way across the bottom of that bit, use a smooth ramp over a distance of double that bit's cutting diameter. So if it's a two and a half inch bit, you would use a five inch ramp distance. That is to allow that bit to cut away the surface of the material as it's ramping in so that you don't end up with uncut material in that area where there is no cutter edge. So, in this case, I have my a smooth ramp set. I'm going to bring that back to 1.0 inches. And I'm not going to make any changes. You could also use an angle. If you would rather set a specific angle, you would set that angle right here. Personally, I prefer to just go with distance, but if you would like for some reason this to cut at a 45 degree angle, then this is where you would set it. I don't see a need to do anything more than 45. If you're going to go with a steep an angle steeper than 45 degrees, there really isn't much need to use a ramp anyway. So, that's just my opinion. Your mileage may vary. Now we'll get into leads. What a lead is, 
it's an addition to the tool path where the bit will actually start cutting somewhere outside the vector, then move over to that vector and start cutting it. Let me turn this tool path on, number three, and we see here we've got two little additions to our tool path. Again, we have our rapid move over here. And these projections out the side of this vector are the leads. And if we look at our illustration here, our rapid move comes over to the start point way over here. This is the start point to the entry lead. It'll plunge down to the first pass depth, then move over and start cutting at this first pass depth make its way over this way and start cutting in this direction. It'll cut around the vector, go past this lead and double cut this area here. Come out this way, retract out of the material, do a rapid move, plunge down to the next pass depth, cut in this direction till it gets to the start point of the vector, Move in this direction, cut around this second pass depth, overcut, stop, come over here, retract, come over in this direction. This is a straight lead with an overcut. Now, when would you want to use a lead like this? Well, if you have ever cut melamine, you will know that you can get some really ragged cuts like this here. Generally speaking, you will find these cuts when you're using an upcut bit or where the bit first plunges into the material because it just chips out the edge. And what you'd like to find is this type of an edge right here. This is where a lead will help out. Also, if you've got a compression bit, you know that the very tip of the compression bit is up cut and the rest of the compression bit is down cut. And where these two meet is the compression area of the router bit. So you've got an area down here at the very tip that's up cut, and the rest here is down cut. Well, when you first go to plunge that material or plunge that bit into this material, you're using the up cut portion. And if this first pass depth isn't beyond this distance here, you're going to get that chip out. Using a lead will allow that bit to plunge into the material out here away from your vector and plunge down to the point to where this upcut portion is down inside the material. And you're cutting with the upcut portion of the bit by the time you get around here to your part. This is also helpful on just any type of material, standard plywood or what have you. If you're using a compression bit, a lead will help you to get a cleaner cut, be it melamine, plywood, something that you have veneered, whichever. So what leads are is leads are an area outside of the vector where the bit plunges in to a certain point, then it can cut up to the vector and cut around the area. Now, this is actually rather slow. It does add machine time because you're cutting an extra distance here, you're overcutting here, and you're cutting an extra distance here. Let me go ahead and go into the tool path, and we can see I have no ramp here, but this tab right here 
is where my lead is. I'm using a straight line lead at an angle of 90 degrees on this particular toolpath. My lead length is one inch, meaning the distance from this vector here to the entry point is one inch. I'm also doing a lead out. Also, here is my overcut. Now I can set that back to zero. And it will not overcut this distance here. So this is the overcut. And that distance is determined by what you enter in your overcut distance. Now, if I don't do a lead out, I'll uncheck that. You can see right now I'm only going to have a lead in. We'll calculate that. I'm getting the warning that the tool is going to cut through the material. And we see that has disappeared. But now there is my retract move right here. If I go back in to my leads and I remove that overcut distance, recalculate, my retract is now right here on the corner. Do a lead out. Don't put in an overcut distance. Calculate. And it figures out where it wants to put that lead out. In this case, down at the bottom here. Those are the straight leads. And again, the lead tab right next to the ramp tab is where you add those leads. We'll go ahead and close that. We'll shut that off. Now, you are not restricted to using just a ramp or just a lead. You can combine them. And in fact, that is sometimes encouraged. Let's take a look at this toolpath. We see here that because of this vector's location, our rapid move is going to come over here to the start point. It's going to plunge down to our Z1 height, and it's going to work its way down, then work its way back to that first pass depth, then lead itself in, come around, make the cut at the first pass depth, then again, come back up this direction, and then ramp its way down to the second position. Cut out on the lead, make the second cut at the second pass depth, all the way down. When it finally gets finished, it will retract out of the lead. Shut this off, and we will come into the toolpath itself. We can see I have a ramp, a smooth ramp, over a distance of one inch, as well as a straight line lead with a 90 degree angle, with a lead length of an inch, doing a lead out, and no overcut. When it comes to using these various leads and ramps, you can use them inside and outside of a vector. If I go over here to my 2D view, you can see I have this circle here. And this is a demonstration of using an outside ramp on that circle. Again, it's the same setup. I've got a quarter inch end mill, six passes. I'm cutting machining to the outside of the vectors. I have a smooth ramp over a distance of one inch. And I'll go ahead and close that without recalculating it. And I'll just turn it on. Now, if we look here, this is a smooth ramp. And we see what it's doing. Again, our rapid move from zero, and here's our plunge over here. It'll plunge down to its Z1, then start the ramp until it comes down here to the first cutting depth, make a circle. Until it gets around here where this first ramp ended, 
and start lowering itself in to the next pass depth, cut its way around, and so on, until it gets to the last cutting depth around here, finishes the toolpath, then retracts all the way out, then that toolpath is finished. The same thing holds true for an inside ramp. Uncheck this, check this one here. Again, it's just a smooth ramp where the bit comes down and starts lowering itself until it gets to that first pass depth, works its way around again to where that ramp ended, slowly ramps itself in to the second pass depth, works its way around, and so on. Let's go over here to this toolpath, and here we have an outside cut with circular vectors, a ramp in and a ramp out with an overcut. Let's take a look at this toolpath. Again, nothing up here has changed. I do not have a ramp selected, but I have a lead selected. This time, I have a circular lead instead of a straight lead. And what that is, is the bit's going to come in a circular motion with a predetermined radius. And we'll set that radius right here. Now I can set it to anything I want. I have it set for one inch. So a one inch radius is the arc that this is going to cut before it comes over and starts cutting this toolpath. And when it finally gets around and cuts out, it's going to cut the same arc. Retract, come over here in a rapid move, come down and plunge into the next pass depth, lead into the part, cut the vector all the way around until it gets out of here, lift up, rapid move back over, plunge into the third pass depth, and so on and so on. This overcut length right here of one inch is what establishes where this is going to ramp in and where this is going to ramp out. If I set that to zero, then recalculate it, it moves to that point right there, meaning I've shortened up my rapid move, but I've also moved my leads. I This one stays in position, but this one is moved. Here's where you have to be careful, because if you remember, if I come out here to my 2D view, I have other parts out here. I need to make sure I don't have a vector interfering. If I do have a vector that's going to interfere, I may or may not be able to use that lead. Let me uncheck this one. We'll check this one and this one. And we'll preview these two toolpaths. Preview visible toolpaths. Comes along and it cuts out my first part. Then it cuts my second one. Uh-oh. My lead cut into this part right here. That is a very real possibility. Let me reset that. And we'll turn on these two toolpaths, and we see now that the lead on this toolpath here interferes with this part right here. So that's something to be mindful of. Let me go ahead and turn off these two toolpaths. I'll go back into my 2D view, and I want to take a look at this vector. I'm going to go into select the vector, I'll go into node editing mode, and there's the problem. Here is my vector start point. Ramps and leads will always start at the vector start point. So, type N to come out of node editing. When I come over here and I calculated my toolpath, with this being the start point, that's where that lead started. To prevent that from happening, what I can do is select the vector, 
type the letter n, and let's pick a start point that's well away from this vector here. Put my cursor over this point down here, right click, make start point. Now I can type n to come out of node editing. Let's go to this toolpath, double click, and I'm not going to make any other changes. Let's recalculate it. And now we see that that lead has changed to where it's no longer going to interfere with this part right here. So we can preview the visible tool paths. And my bit did not interfere with this part here. So that's something to watch out for. Be careful of where your start points are. And if you should find some interference, change your vector start point so that the lead will not interfere. Let's take another look at something similar. This toolpath here, which is an inside cut, let's go ahead and take a look. I'm machining to the inside of the vectors. And I'm using a smooth ramp over a distance of one inch. And I've got a circular lead with a distance of one inch, or excuse me, with a one inch radius and a lead length of half an inch. Because I need to start it closer in here, because we're cutting to the inside, remember. If I try to do an inside lead of an inch long, it may or may not have room to do it here. I'm going to have it do a lead out. I'm not going to use any overcut distance. I don't need it to overcut. Let's go ahead and calculate. It's going to cut through the material. OK. And now we get to this error here. One or more leads were clipped or removed. To avoid gouging, one or more leads had to be reduced in length or removed completely. Check the toolpath is still suitable for your requirements. What that means is, let me double click here, using a circular lead on an inside cut with a one inch radius, even if I reduce it to a half an inch, the radius is so big that the lead would start out here somewhere and would cut into my material. It isn't big enough with that radius to put that lead in here. Now, a way I can fix that is use a straight lead. Without changing anything else, calculate it. I don't get that error. And there is my straight lead. It comes inside the material and starts ramping in and makes that cut. Remember, this is the part I'm going to throw away. This is the part that I'm going to be using. So, remembering if you should get this clipping error, if you were to get this clipping error, check to make sure that your lead is not going to damage the part and make any adjustments. That's why you get that error. If it were to try to calculate those circular leads, the lead would start outside of that vector when we have told it to cut to the inside of that vector. So I would either need to reduce the lead length again or reduce the radius or both. It's easier just to use a straight line lead. So, I hope this video helped you to understand a little bit about leads and ramps, what they are, when you would use them. I mentioned before that they're used almost always with the profile toolpath. The profile toolpath is the only place you will find leads. You will find ramps in other toolpaths, but you have limited options 
for instance, in a pocket tool path. Down here, you'll see you have the option to ramp in your plunge moves on a pocket over a distance. You can't adjust the angle. Your only option is to use distance. You also have it available in the inlay tool path. You can ramp and lead. You also have ramps available in a 3D roughing tool path. You can ramp in your move over a set distance. You will not find ramps or leads that are adjustable. In drilling, quick engrave, V carve, photo V carve, fluting has its own ramps because that's half of the fluting toolpath, the texturing toolpath, the prism carving tool path or the molding tool path, which also has its own ramping. You will not find standard ramps in these here. Now, in the fluting tool path, half of the fluting tool path is the ramp. And you have the ramp type here, be it linear or smooth. Other than that, ramps and leads are mainly used in the profile tool path. When would you use a ramp? I use them almost all the time, mainly to eliminate those dwell marks and to help reduce bit deflection. It's easier on the bit to use a ramp, it's easier on the machine to use a ramp, and it's easier on the material to use a ramp. So I use ramps on almost every profile toolpath, unless I'm just demonstrating here on a video. Leads, I tend not to use very much at all. You would use a lead if you're using a compression bit or you have another situation where you would like to start your toolpath away from the piece, then move the bit into the vector that you're trying to cut out. They're very handy for compression bits. So, I hope you got something out of this video. If you did, I hope you'll give me a thumbs up. And again, I'd like to remind you that today at noon Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern, I'll be hosting a live Q&A session where we'll talk more about ramps, leads, or anything else I've discussed in this video. So, if you feel a bit confused now, I do hope you'll join us for that live Q&A session this afternoon on my YouTube channel. I'll put a link to that live Q&A session down in the description of this video. We have a lot of fun in these live Q&A sessions, and it's a good reason to go ahead and subscribe to my channel if you're not already a subscriber. When you click that red subscribe button down below this video, click that little bell right next to it. Then click it again and set that to all notifications. That way you'll be notified the next time I post a video and the next time I go live. So, again, I hope to see you this afternoon. And as always, whether you subscribe to my channel or not, I'd like to thank you very much for taking the time to watch, and y'all take care.